Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of John, the 11th chapter, the 35th verse. Jesus wept. Thank you, Jane. I want us to take a moment just real quickly to say welcome to all of the visitors who are here today. I know we have a number of uh, new faces in the worship this morning, and we're so happy that you are here. I want to uh, extend a welcome on behalf of the church, and if you would like to on your way out this morning, we have guest bags, both back out here in the narthex as well as in the main lobby, and we hope that you'll take one of those. They're, they're white bags about this tall. You can't miss them on the little tables. Please grab one of those on your way out as uh, a way of us saying welcome, and we're glad that you are here today. Also, for our visitors and those of you who have not maybe been here for the past couple of weeks, we are now in week three of a four-week sermon series that uh, I've called Pixar in the Pulpit. Pixar, you may know, uh, is uh, a group that is an animation studio that's owned by the Disney Corporation. And they uh, started about 20-some years ago making these films that really were uh, pioneering in the genre of animation at the time, computer-generated uh, images and animations that were told, uh, from a, uh, told wonderful storylines, but were probably equally engaging for adults as they were for kids. This last week, we watched a movie called Inside Out, and I know probably not all of you have seen it, uh, but to give you a, a little bit of a summary of what happened in the movie, uh, there's a story of a young girl who's 12 years old at, at the time the movie takes place. Her name is Riley, and everything is going good for Riley. She seems like a, a normal American kid. She's, uh, she grows up in the suburbs. She, she loves her, her friends and her family. Her parents adore her. Her favorite thing in the world is playing ice hockey, and uh, she seems like a great kid. But before the opening credits even roll, we find out that Riley is about to undergo a massive change in her life as her family packs up everything and they move west to California. They get to California and uh, immediately she goes through all of the things that if you've ever done that, moved as a kid, you know all of the emotions and the drama that will follow. Things like going into a new house in a new city. Uh, what is your bedroom going to look like when you get there? What is the first day of school going to entail? And so forth. Now, the way that this movie approaches it, however, is that we see a little bit of what Riley is doing, but most of the movie takes place inside of the 12-year-old's brain, where we have five cartoon characters. And those characters are Joy, which represents joy and happiness and the emotion of, of joy in her life. Then there is the, the blue character who always is sulking and has her hair down over her eyes, and she's sadness. And then we have the green character, and she represents disgust. We also have a, a tall, skinny character who is fear. And lastly, we have a short and stout red character named fire, or named anger, who shoots fire out of his head when he gets especially angry. And all five of these emotions sit behind a giant control panel in Riley's brain, and they control her emotions with levers and buttons. They build memories, and they put those memories into storage, and they pull them out at special times. And it's all about all of these emotions that we experience in our lives. And so, of course, it doesn't take much in the plot line of what's going on in Riley's life to realize that the emotions are going to be working in overdrive and she is relocating, starting at a new school, having to make new friends, and so on and so forth, and all the things that she's leaving behind. So one of the interesting things that happens in the first few minutes of the film is that we see that Joy is the primary character. She is always trying to run the show. She is trying to make the best out of every single situation. And even though every once in a while disgust or fear or anger try to chime in, she can take what they give, but then she wants to spin it to make it more positive again. She's always wanting to put a, a happy take on everything. But then comes the moment where it's the first day of school for Riley. And she walks, and she's excited that she leaves the house, and then she gets to the school, and she looks up at this great big building, goes in the door, and we see her now seated in a classroom where she knows nobody. Joy has already got this day planned out well. She has fear to make a bunch of different plausible scenarios that might happen during the day and how we might counteract them to make them positive. And fear comes up with all sorts of far-fetched things like quicksand and other things that she might encounter on the first day of school. 
envy or uh, disgust is there and she's looking at all the things that she's going to try to figure out how to fit in, how to be cool, how to represent herself well. But Joy is most concerned about making sure that she contains sadness. So she goes over to sadness and says, I have a special job for you today. She puts her arm around her and then she draws a chalk circle on the ground and she says, I need you to stay right in here today and make sure that you don't leave this circle. And sadness says, but what? No, no, no. You need to stay there today. We're going to make sure everything is perfect on the first day of school for Riley. It's one of these moments that you realize that this film isn't just a kid's film. It's speaking very much to us as adults. And as you're watching this film, you start to realize that it could be talking about Riley, the 12-year-old, but it's also talking about or speaking a truth to us as well. We are very much a product of a culture and we were raised in this kind of tradition that says that above all, we need to be happy. Happiness is paramount for us. We need to strive for happiness. It's the thing we want for our children more than anything else. We just want them to be happy. Yes, we want them to, to have uh, a, a someone that they can know and love, to feel like they belong, to, to uh, experience uh, some sort of uh, comfort level and stability within their finances and their employment, and we want them to have a deep and abiding faith and a relationship with Christ, and we want them to be happy. We talk about wanting that for ourselves, too. And when it's put into the form of a cartoon, we realize that oftentimes what we try to do is we try to draw a little circle off to the side where we push sadness into her place and try to keep her suppressed there as well. Because it doesn't make us comfortable to feel sadness. We get uneasy about that. We feel that creeping in and we want to push it aside. We want to put on our best face. We don't want the world around us to know that we're unhappy either. And it's frowned upon. We know that it's not socially acceptable to talk about our sadness. I mean, of course, there's some circumstances. Sure, when there's a death, it's normal to be sad. And if we're not sad, people think that there's something wrong with us. When there's something that's horrible that's happened, we lose a job, we've been sick. Someone that we, that we love is, is in, in harm's way. These are times that we experience sadness and it's appropriate to do so. But on a day-to-day -day basis, when everything is sort of just normal status quo, we know that the voices around us are telling us that it's unacceptable to show our sadness. And this is only exacerbated more, perhaps, with the, the advent of things like social media. And we already know that all of these different social media applications have been critiqued for all of the ways that we always want to present our best selves to the world. And so we put up the things of our kids smiling and getting along together. Or we put up the pictures of everybody got their eyes open in this family picture on a vacation. Or we want to talk about the promotion that we got, or the, the new outfit that we're wearing, or the dinner that we whipped up like it was no big thing when it was a huge undertaking. We want to present this to the world like this is who we are, don't we have our act together, isn't everything lovely, there's no sadness in my life. But we know that that's not true. That's not the way it is, and yet this is how we feel like we need to present ourselves. And I think maybe the stakes are even higher when it comes to Christian people. We talk about living our lives as, as people of God's word and, and the promises of our faith. And we are, we are people of resurrection and people of promise and recipients of, of God's grace and, and glory of Christ. And so, by gosh, we better be the ones that are out there with a grin from ear to ear every single day. What are we showing the world about who we are and the faith that we claim to have if, if we're gloomy, we have down days, we're a little off? And so we try to keep sadness in her little circle, and we don't let her in for fear that things might get uncomfortable for us. We talk about it like it would wreck our day or our experience, but it's always back there in the background anyway. And we don't want to acknowledge it. And that's interesting because that's not the story that the scriptures tell. When we look at the Bible, we look, for example, we look to the Psalms. These lovely poetic verses. It takes up a huge chunk of the Old Testament. And by some counts, one third of the Psalms are Psalms of lament. Meaning that there's some kind of 
emotion that's expressed that's either sadness or confusion or tragedy or appealing to God for mercy or things are really difficult right now and we need you nearer than ever before. A third of the Psalms are written like this. There's a whole book in the Old Testament called Lamentations, which is all about laments, all about the ways that life is not satisfying to us, that things are not happy and on the up and up. And they speak to us with a rawness and a truth that is unvarnished and shows us that this is a part of the normal human experience. And yet, we try to keep it at bay. The sadness, the negativity. We keep up this illusion that everything's going right. You heard just a moment ago from John read the shortest verse in all of Scripture. Jesus wept. And yes, I know, it was a little bit hokey that I chose just to have one verse. It happens to be the shortest verse in the Bible. But it's in there for a reason. It's in there for a purpose. It's a part of a larger story of Jesus finding out after he's gone far away from the village of Bethany where Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus live, that they find out Jesus and his disciples get word that Lazarus has died. And Jesus says, okay, we better walk back to Judea. We better walk back into the village of Bethany. Let's pay a visit to that family. We need to go back there. And everybody said, yeah, but we need to get a move on. Like, let's giddy up. And Jesus says, it'll be okay when we get there. Trust me. And we know that Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And so he's a little bit easy about this at a time when everybody else is sort of geared up. But when Jesus actually gets to the village and he gets to the outside of the home of Mary and Martha, where Lazarus is inside, he sees the people weeping. He sees the people grieving, beating their breasts, and in deep grief and despair. And Jesus is so moved by everybody else's reaction that the Gospel writer took a whole verse just to say that Jesus cried. Now sometimes this is lifted up as an example. See, Jesus is, Jesus is fully human. He understands the range of human emotions. Jesus, as the church has always taught, is fully human and fully divine. But I think that we need to also look at this scripture as an example of Jesus saying, it's okay to be people of faith and to be overcome with these kinds of emotions. This is a part of the human experience. You need not suppress this and keep this away and pretending that everything is okay. And I know that people of faith, oftentimes, when there is a death that they are grieving, they put on a good face and they say, well, but our faith assures us that there is resurrection and that we are saved in faith and that my loved one is, is in heaven or heaven bound. And that's a great thing, but most of the time, there's still a sadness that needs to accompany that. It's not a contradiction of faith to believe that someone is saved and resurrected and in heaven and at the same time, mourn the fact that a life has come to a close. I think that that's what Jesus is showing us in this. He loved Lazarus. He knew him. He knew he was going to resurrect him. And he, he was still overcome with the sadness in the moment that brought him to tears. This is not something that we just want to whitewash and make it all go away. This is not something that just because we're Christians, we say we then set sadness aside and we don't have to deal with it. And a number of years ago, at a funeral, I actually heard this quote from the 20th century German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who you may remember some of his story. He was imprisoned by the Nazis in his opposition to the Third Reich. But he shared these words about death, and I'm not sure that everybody is going to agree with him on this, and I think it's very provocative. But listen to these words and see if you find some truth in them. Bonhoeffer says this, First, nothing can console us when we lose a beloved person, and no one should try. We have to simply bear and survive it. That sounds hard, but is in fact a great consolation. When the whole remains unfilled, we remain connected through it. 
I'll read that again. When the hole remains unfilled, we remain connected through it. It is wrong to say that God fills the gap because he keeps it empty and so helps us to sustain our old communion even through pain. Then, he says, the more beautiful and fulfilling our memories, the harder the separation. But gratefulness transforms the agony. Gratefulness transforms the agony. I think what he's trying to say here is that the rawness that we experience in the grief and the loss of a loved one is something that we don't necessarily need to find a substitute thing to fill that space. If you think back to the most painful moments in your life, is there not a part of you that is grateful in some way for them? They're formative. They have shaped you into the person that you have become. They may have pushed you in your faith to be more solid in it rather than more shallow in it. I think back to the most difficult things in my whole life, and I don't want to forget them. I don't want them to be replaced with joy. I want to retain a piece of that because, as he says, there is still a hole there, but it allows an openness for those memories to continue to remain. If those memories are done away with because I have filled it with a joy, I've lost that connection. This is what happens in the movie. Joy and sadness are sitting together one night and they start to reminisce about a memory in Riley's life. And they realize that one of their favorite memories they have in common. And Joy can't understand this. How is it that you and I remember the same event and it's your favorite and it's my favorite? Joy says, that was the night that the whole hockey team hoisted us up on their shoulders and carried us around and mom and dad threw their arms around us and we all hugged under the big tree in our backyard and they, and they held me and we were together. And sadness says, yeah, because that was the night that Riley missed the winning shot in the big game. And she was so distraught by that that the whole team came together, lifted her up on their shoulders and mom and dad came over and embraced Riley and held us under the tree in our backyard. Sometimes they're one and the same. Sometimes those moments of sadness are also the ones where we feel the presence of Jesus more than ever before. Sometimes those moments that are the most raw and painful and difficult for us are the ones where the community of faith comes together and lifts us up on their shoulders, embraces us, and lets us know that we are loved and not alone. It's not a matter of just taking anything that's negative or sad or difficult in us and shoving it aside. It's about finding the way to bring that in and say, this is a part of what makes us whole. This is a part of what makes us who we are. This is a part of our story. So as the church, we need to remember that's a part of our responsibility. That when we come together, we do so in love, lifting each other up, raising each other through the difficult circumstances and remembering that we are there for one another. But it's also about what Christ Jesus does, the one who knows our expressions of pain because he has been there himself. And as the traditional liturgy from the United Methodist Funeral Rites state, that we know Christ because he knew our griefs, he dies our death, and he rises for our sake. Let's pray.